to sort out all the papers. Wonderful. Good to be back with you again. And, um, and you've got me again in a couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just prompt you a little bit there. Excuse me a moment. Thank you. So today we continue with this uh, I Am series that you've been going through. Um, these sayings of Jesus recorded in John's Gospel. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you'll discover as you read in the New Testament that Jesus speaks often about the kingdom. But when we get to the I Am sayings, and there's seven or eight of them, he speaks about the king, not the kingdom, the king of the kingdom, Jesus, the king. And uh, as Ali has already given you three quarters of all my sermon, um, I'll just remind you, because it's always good to chew things over more than once, isn't it? Um, she's a wonderful lady in her preparation. Uh, the picture tells um, uh, of the good shepherd. Uh, uh, we, we know the parable of um, the 99 sheep that stay in that enclosure. You're going to see more pictures of an enclosure in a minute. Um, and, and then there's one that goes missing and, and the good shepherd goes and searches out for that uh, sheep that's gone missing. And of course, we love to sing that song, the Lord's my shepherd. And we sing it in many different occasions, sometimes at funerals, sometimes at weddings and sometimes in morning services. Yeah. So. Good. Well done. Now, see if I can get it to work. Now. No. Next one, please. Well, you've probably done what I've done. My husband whispered in my ear that I hadn't switched it. All right. <laughs> and did you turn it off? <laughs> okay. Anything could happen now. Oh, okay. It has already. So, series of questions this morning. First one What's been happening in this lead up uh, to Jesus describing himself as the gate? bit of a strange thing to call yourself. The immediate context relates to the ongoing fallout since Jesus, you can read it in the, in the previous chapter, has healed a man uh, who was born blind. And the folk that, that are the religious authorities in that area are really ticked off with what Jesus has done. Uh, they just don't understand it and don't think it was necessary. And why touch this man in the first place? And you can read all about that. And there's an enormous fallout uh, with what with what happens. So I'm going to try and relate a little bit of that later on. Uh, but trouble has been brewing for Jesus, not just in what we would now call chapter nine. The story of today is in chapter 10. But it goes right the way back to just after the very first miracle where Jesus turns water into wine. Very soon after that, he goes into the temple courts and he drives out all the money changers, et cetera, and the merchants, shouting at them that they have made uh, the, the Lord's house uh, a place of, of robbers rather than a house of prayer. Uh, so right the way back, there's been some contention. And in all the following chapters that we've got in John's Gospel, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then into ten, uh, there's contention, there's awkwardness between the religious leaders and what Jesus has been saying and doing. So, oh, okay, there you go. There's all those different chapter areas. I won't go through them all, but they are there. I'll leave it up just for a moment or two before I change. So what does it all mean? Well, on the physical, practical side of things, Jesus is talking to a largely rural agricultural group of people, a society where the neighboring enclosures um, are, you would be able to see from the city and uh, you would notice different uh, ways of these enclosures. The ones that, that Ali described to us, but mainly these type, which would have on the top of them briars and brambles to uh, to further prevent folk climbing over the walls and getting at the sheep. And yes, as we've had described to us already, narrow entrances through which the, uh, the, the flocks passed at nightfall. And they would be safely protected from predators, from robbers, from thieves, 
and from wolves uh, while they were in that type of enclosure. Often several herds would use the same enclosure uh, at night, all go going into that one place. And in the morning, the shepherd would come and call out his own sheep by name. And you think, well, how would he know them all by name? One sheep looks the same as the rest, uh, surely. Except I have a friend of mine who uh, works for Trans World Radio, and he's made a study of sheep, and he knows all the different ones. I don't know how they all look white and woolly to me. Um, so uh, very rarely would a shepherd ever end up in the morning calling out these sheep with a sheep that came from a different herd or a different flock because the sheep knew the shepherd's name and the, the, the distinctive call that they had. Going back in the eons time when I had hair, there was a TV program called One Man and His Dog. And some of you, older uh, than others of you, will remember it. it was a program about a shepherd and sheep and how he got them into a little pen. And they had a distinctive call and the sheep would recognize that call and the sheep dog would recognize that call. The audience of religious leaders and rulers standing around Jesus as he's talking about shepherding and uh, gates knew exactly what he was actually talking about. And they also knew the deeper meaning behind his stories. You see, shepherd was a term long used and long applied right the way back in the Old Testament, meaning uh, spiritual leaders. And the word sheep, long back in the Old Testament, was literally used to talk about a nation, the nation of Israel. The contrast between Jesus and these religious leaders couldn't be more stark. The religious folk might lay down their lives for truth. They might do that. For more than once, men of Israel had refused to fight on the Sabbath and had been killed easily by pagan forces and armies. More than one Israelite had offered his life, his body, to Roman swords rather than permit a statue of Caesar or legion eagles to be put up in the temple in Jerusalem. To die for a conviction was not that uncommon. To die for the love of sheep? Never. Truth was more important to the authorities. People were not. You might think that's strange. By translating shepherds to mean spiritual leaders, the Jews knew that matters of welfare, provision, protection, and pastoral concern should have been uppermost in the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious teachers. But those guys cared little about ordinary men and women and children. They were quick to demand respect and to demand obedience, quick to lord it over others, quick to judge and advise and criticize and condemn. No one could ever imagine for one moment, a scribe or a Pharisee or a ruler or a leader would lay down their lives for commoners. I'm going to say more about that later on. But to Jesus, our saviour, the sheep were sinners. The leaders condemned them as con by, by their contemptuousness and their self-righteous stuff. But Jesus knew these were sinners worth dying for. And because our own shepherd, our own good shepherd, interposes his body between the religious leaders and all these sinners and dying for us on a cross so that we might have life, he is able to speak about life abundantly, life fulsome, life more than we could ever imagine or expect. So, how does this work? Well, in John's gospel, Jesus explains what this means. And uh, this is where Ali has actually done my job for me. And so I'll chew it over again because it's important to hear it twice. Each night, all the flocks were safely gathered within the enclosure. 
the shepherd would lay down across the entrance. And I was actually going to do that uh, today. And then I chickened out. I was going to go and choose one of your two doors here and just lie down there and try and balance my notes and, and this thing and uh, show you what it all meant. And I thought, well, the camera is going to go do Lally and I'm going to chicken out. So that won't make any difference, will it? But a shepherd didn't ever chicken out. They lay in front of her entrance and by doing so gave an assurance of security, authority and pastoral care. There were no steel doors. There weren't any gates. There was just human flesh. But no wild animal, no thief who uses trickery or robbery that uses violence would be able to attack the flock without first attacking the shepherd. It's interesting that hired hands on zero hours contracts would run away and abandon the flocks, fleeing for their own lives. Not so the shepherd. Each shepherd was the doorman for every enclosure in all weathers, in all climate conditions, even when it's freezing outside. I'm reminded of a story of a father uh, who took his two young children out for uh, a walk across the moors while they were on holiday one time. And suddenly the weather changed on the moor. And uh, in fact, it began to snow. The temperature fell, it began to snow heavily. And very, very quickly, this family were freezing cold and lost. It was one of those bombs where you have a whiteout and you can't actually find where you are or where, where you've come from. And uh, the dad quickly worked out that as the snow got deeper and deeper and they got colder and colder, and it was a real bomb of snow, he actually dug a snow hole and, they, and he pushed his children inside the snow hole to try to protect them. But the driving blizzard of snow and the amount of snow was actually filling up where the hole was. So it was going into the hole where the children had been pushed for safety. So the dad lay across the entrance of the snow hole. 24 hours later, the rescuers found the snow hole and the family and the children were safe and well and warm. And the dad had died. He gave his life for those children. He lay across the entrance. The good shepherd, the gate, would do exactly and has done that for us. Preaching this message only five weeks after Advent and Christmas, when shepherds were undoubtedly given a lot of airplay, um, it's, it's fantastic. I love it. I wonder if you were told all about how disrespected shepherds were, the scum of the earth. I wonder if you were told that. Uh, I wonder if you were told that there were many folk living in, a, in and around Jerusalem for whom shepherds could well have been considered what Jeff Lucas calls rogues, scoundrels, and scallywags. I like that. I think I'm part of that. Don't you? Oh, come on, church. Oh, shake yourself down a bit. Get rid of the frost. Are you a rogue, a scoundrel, or a scallywag? God loves those folk. You don't have to be a shepherd to be one, by the way. I've always disagreed with those who don't like shepherds. I've always thought that these guys get a bad press. I always thought they did an amazing and difficult job, working in all sorts of unhealthy conditions with very little comfort and very dangerous work. Think of all the lambs in that era of that time outside Jerusalem that were bred for sacrifice. Think of all the wool that was used for clothing, even though sometimes they use camel's hairs. Think of all the bedding that had been made with nice lamb's wool. Think of all the meat that was consumed. I'm sorry if you're vegetarian. At the Colne Valley Heritage Railway, where I work on Mondays and Tuesdays as the estates manager, I'm sometimes called upon to make and fit new gates. That's what I do. 
and they prevent visitors from accessing dangerous sections of the line or equipment, and they also keep staff and visitors safe. Last weekend, I was in North Yorkshire, and my daughter-in-law's mum asked me to fix the bolt on her gate to stop it banging in the wind, and also so that once she could apply the bolt, she could feel safe inside her own garden. I've forgotten all my PowerPoint things. I wonder what I've got here. Oh, look. Shepherds. Gates. Nothing works. Next picture, please, somebody. So it should say, what should I do? Oh, look at that. Fantastic. Cool. I should be using this, shouldn't I? So I could see what I'm doing. Okay. Technology. The sheep gate. This is what I wanted to get to. This is what I've been so excited about coming here to tell you today. I, I, we've done all the other stuff. We've done the, the preliminaries. Now let's get to some meat. The sheep gate in Jerusalem was one of 12 gates around that city. It was the first gate to be rebuilt in Nehemiah's time. The sheep gate was designed for animals to go through it. Guess what animals went through the sheep gate? Thank you. Sheep went through the sheep gate. And once inside the city, they entered into the temple courts and there was only one door in where the sheep went and no lamb ever came back after entering that temple through that city gate. They traveled in only one direction, and then they were sacrificed for the sins of men and women. Sheep were always used as sacrificial victims. The sheep gate was also the place where those people whose society didn't want were abandoned to. They put the incurable, the paralyzed, the lame, the rogues, the scoundrels, and the scallywags outside the sheep gate and next to the pool of Siloam, which was just outside that gate, right on the edge of the city, where only country folk herding livestock pass through, out of sight of respectable citizens at the heart of the city going about their business. The sheep gate was the place of no return for the abandoned people of Jerusalem. And then here comes Jesus. And then here comes Jesus turning things over for close inspection, turning things round in his revolution of boundless healing love, telling the people of Jerusalem, I am the gate. For the sheep who enters through me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I came that may, they may have life and have it abundantly. The sheep being taken to the temple altar and the paralyzed people at the pool had one fundamental thing in common. They were victims of a sacrificial regime. For the respectable people of that society to stay respectable religiously, they had to find a way to deal with their transgressions, to atone for their sins. And the way they found that was to sacrifice lambs on the altar to God who would accept their payment and forgive them. The way that the respectable people of that society wanted to keep their society respectable, not just their religious faith, they had to purge it of all that made it impure to their eyes, to send to the edge all those who didn't fit, who upset the equilibrium. And they found that the way to do that was to relocate the sick and the lost and the lame out to that pool behind the sheep gate. Those shameful people removed well away from the heart of things. They had to be sacrificed for the sake of all. 
And so proclaiming himself as the gate for the sheep, Jesus came to overturn and challenge that need for sacrifice and in its place to offer salvation, the freedom for victims to come and go and find pasture and abundant lives. Here comes Jesus saying, no, 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 wait, I am the gate, the gate. Whoever enters through me will be sacrificed. No, saved. And the paralyzed man he'd healed earlier that day didn't just have his body, body's muscular functions restored. And the man who was blind didn't just have new eyeballs put in his head. Jesus' healing freed those people from the power of a sacrificial system which had bound them to stay outside the city. Get out of the way. We be hidden from us. We don't like the sight of you guys. Do you know the guy that was healed by the pool had been there 38 years? 38 years. Just out of the way. We don't want you. We don't deal with stuff like you. Can you imagine that? And some of us have been trapped in stuff over the years. 38 years, 48 years, 68 years, 18 years. And we've never been free because we got pushed or pushed ourselves into some sort of place where we didn't want anybody to hurt us anymore or ignore us any further. Think about it. And Jesus comes and says, I am the gate. You see, when we think of gates, we think of them shut. But he says, you can come in and go out through this gate. It's an open gate. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And you know, that dear man that had been healed after 38 years of being shut out, outside the sheep gate, the sacrifice gate. Do you know what happened to him? It says in chapter 9 of uh, John, it says some of the Jewish leaders were enraged at him and said to him, just who do you think you are to lecture us? You were born a blind, filthy sinner. And they threw the man out on the street. <laughs> and here comes Jesus. And here comes Jesus, the gate for the sheep, who enters, whoever enters through me will be saved. And as for the sheep of Jesus' parable, the sheep gate had been a one-way passage to, to slaughter, a place of no return. Jesus, the opened gate, the generous gate, the loving gate, permitted them freedom to roam, to come and go at will to find pasture which pleased them, no longer confined by a system that abandoned them to death and destruction, which corralled them into a dangerous place at the mercy of thieves and rustlers and scammers and all those who would harm them. Jesus opens a gate today to everyone who is vulnerable, releasing us from a bondage to a system of sacrifice and makes us aware of his abundant life for all. How did he do this? How did he do this? There's that picture. I got it as well, you see. How did he do this? Well, he changes his metaphor to show us something deeper. He says, I'm the good shepherd. So I'm not just the gate. I'm the shepherd of that gate. I'm the gate of that shepherd. And as the sheep go through the gate, that one-way gate to sacrifice, he goes with them. Hallelujah. He goes. There he is. They hear his voice. On the one-way journey to the temple uh, for slaughter, Jesus makes the same journey there too. He went to the altar of the cross to be sacrificed for the sin of men and women. 
And even more, he changes the metaphor. In fact, John the Baptist does, right the way back near the beginning of John's gospel, because he sees Jesus coming down to the river Jordan to be baptized, and he calls out, behold, the Lamb of God, who dies for the sin of the whole world. Wow. So Jesus is a gate, he's a shepherd, and he's a sacrificial lamb, and he is our God. And he does this because he wants to see people not kept outside, but included. Hallelujah. Sin of the world. Did you notice what John the Baptist said? The sin of the world. Because the whole impact of what had happened at the beginning of our world impacts us still. It is the sin of being separated from God by our own, our own scallywagness, our own scoundrelness, our own insistence on being separate from God. Do you know, it didn't just stop at a sacrificial lamb. It didn't just stop as a gate and a shepherd. Our Jesus was resurrected. And you're going to have a sermon on I am the resurrection and the life in a few weeks' time. I'm not delivering that one. The next one I do is I am the way, the truth, the life. And I'm waiting to see what God's going to tell us about that. Death, you see, couldn't hold this sacrificial lamb. Sacrifice couldn't stop him. Jesus defeated death. And by doing so, overcame a system of sacrifice which makes victims even more vulnerable. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And ever since he came back from the dead, the system of sacrifice has been in crisis. It doesn't work anymore. The death of Jesus, the innocent victim, opened our eyes to the, to the falseness of that sacrificial system and its injustice. The resurrection of Jesus, the victim raised, has affected our view of life ever since. You and I are the nearest folk will ever get to see a good shepherd if they don't yet know Jesus. Did you know that? You and I are the the, the only way that some people will ever get to see the Good Shepherd, ever get to understand that there's a gateway that they can come in and go out through, which leads to eternal life. Every time you stand up for truth, every time you stand up for morality and justice and refuse to bow to compromise or tolerance or intolerance, you are acting like a gate to protect men and women and children from thieves and robbers and wolves. In other words, from tricksters and brutes and scammers and predators. Every time you put yourself out to go the extra mile, to make that awkward and essential telephone call, to write that thoughtful card, to take those flowers, to make up a food parcel, to talk to somebody that you wouldn't normally talk to or someone on their own, to check on your elderly neighbour, to use your time for someone else, to email a thank you to somebody, to simply hold the hand of a needy person. Do I need to go on? You are opening a gate for another person to glimpse the love and the protection of Jesus. None of these activities are ever wasted. In Revelation, right at the end of the Bible, it tells me about heaven. I am looking forward to going there. It's how I get there is I'm not so familiar with or friendly towards. But one day I'll get there. And do you know what I'll see? I'll see what you guys see. I'll see a city. And round that city, there are 12 gates. And every gate is made of a pearl. I can't imagine what that looks like. 
but it's fabulous. And do you know what it says about those gates? It says they will never be shut. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful, if you didn't know it is. It's wonderful. The gates of heaven are not shut. Why? Because there is always room for you and me in there. And we've got to get there somehow. Of course, Jesus says about gates, and he said about it before his death. Enter through the narrow gate. For broad is the way and wide is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate that leads to life. And few find it. Wow. So Jesus says, as we finish today, behold, I stand at the gate, the door, the entrance. If anyone hears me and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The Passion Translation says, so repent and be eager to pursue what is right. I'm standing at the door knocking. If your heart is open to hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and feast with you, and you will feast with me. Amen. Dear God, thank you. The doors and gates and entrances I suspect that every single one of us locked our front doors before we came to church, made sure the windows were shut. And when we drove here, we locked our cars and we heard the bleep of our remote controls convincing us it was safe. We came through a gate. Uh, getting into this church, you have to press buttons and things, but we got in and we're going to have to press them to get out. And we're going back out into a world where there are thieves and robbers and scammers and predators. And they want to trap us. Sometimes even religious people want us, want nothing to do with ordinary people. Lord, thank you for Jesus, the gate, the good shepherd and the sacrificial lamb. Thank you that we can make a difference in our society by pointing people at the gate and helping them to go through. Jesus, thank you that you're our gateway to heaven and beyond. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. <laughs>